What's up, Canada? This is former WWE superstar, wrestling worldwide superstar, Snitsky. And I'm here to review my career from all the way back to Nesquahoney, all the way up to today, right here, live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, for the Hannibal TV, right there in Canada, Ontario, Canada. Check it out. If you don't, it's not my fault. <laughs> This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com and I'm with former WWE superstar Gene Snitsky who was also an ECW that was put on by WWE and he's also an actor. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm fabulous. How are you today, Mr. Good. Hannibal? You got your Philadelphia Eagles cap on. Are you a Philadelphia fan? Oh yeah, diehard. Been a uh, diehard Eagles fan, bleeding green since I'm a little kid and actually uh, Coach Reed was actually my offensive line coach at Missouri, so I have a lot of history with Philly, but yep, definitely a diehard Eagles fan. Uh, to start this off, if you could just tell us where you grew up and uh, what your childhood was like. Uh, I grew up in a small coal mining town, Nesquahoning, Pennsylvania. Basically, uh, southern tip of the Poconos, right outside of Jim Thorpe. Most people know where Jim Thorpe is. Uh, Normal childhood, my parents are awesome. I still, you know, fortunately have them both. They're still alive, still living in Nesquahoning and, uh, you know, still run of the mill, small town USA stuff. We had one stoplight and, you know, it's, uh, it was a good uh, good time growing up in the 70s and 80s back in good old Nesquahoning. You mentioned you played football. Uh, was that the main sport you played when you were younger? Actually, you played basketball, football, baseball, did them all. It was. Uh, Starting center for the Keystone State games in Pennsylvania in basketball, which was uh, like the Pennsylvania State Olympics. Yeah. And uh, went to camps for tryouts, and then they pick like, you know, a handful of guys to go try out for the team. And then I was fortunate enough to make the team, and that was a nice experience doing that, you know. Uh, football, first team all state, played in the first championship team in the history of my high school. Uh, Signed a full scholarship to play at Missouri. Got recruited by pretty much every school in the country, but uh, chose Missouri, went out to Mizzou. Played there from 88 to 93. Signed with the Chargers after college. I went to the NFL Combines, did all that. Uh, I camped with the Chargers. Aggravated a pre-existing injury that they misdiagnosed at Missouri. They thought I had subluxed in my shoulder, but I actually tore my uh, labrum. So a couple months into San Diego, I had to get surgery done, got the labrum repaired, came back, played in the CFL for the Birmingham Barracudas for a little bit. Retired from football in 95, started training to wrestle in 96. Uh, How was the CFL expansion league? Uh, terrible, no offense to my Canadian friends out there. But uh, yeah, it wasn't what I had expected. It was pretty much like playing college football again. Like, they, you had to bring your own equipment and stuff like that, it was crazy. Like, I was like, this is pro football. I guess just because it was the expansion, you know, they were trying to expand it in the United States and do the, the American teams. So, I mean, I could see why it was like that, but at that point in my career, with the shoulder and, you know, wasn't really that great of money at the time. Just kind of retired from football in 95 and then Always wanted to wrestle, watched it as a kid, was always, you know, enthralled with the characters and the larger than life personas and just always wanted to do it. So I was like, oh, well, now's my chance. So I was, I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason, so. Do you think the XFL is going to do better this time around? Well, they can't do any worse. <laughs> <laughs> I think they had good ratings one week and then all of a sudden, you know, next thing you know, they're folding. So if they make it through one season with, uh, you know, making actual profits. I mean, I hope they do. I think it's cool. I, I like the concept. I love the concept back when they first did it. Unfortunately, the guys weren't very good. No knock on the guys, but I mean, you're watching NFL football and then you watch XFL and it's like, kind of like night and day, really. But uh, the concept was cool. All their little niches they had. And I mean, now the NFL uses their camera system because they started with that zoom in camera from on top with the cables. That's where the NFL got it from, so, I mean, all in all, it was a pretty cool deal. 
and uh, actually jokingly put on uh, Twitter one time that I was going to try out for the XFO. Is it a joke or not? We'll have to find out. They're paying <laughs> less than the CFL, I guess, overall at this point, so I don't know yeah. how tempted it would be financially. But you I, I would decide yeah, still to make it. I would do it just for shits and grins, you know? Just to see if I could still play, you know? Because <laughs> I'm very competitive, my wife will tell you. My lovely wife, Carolyn, who's... Uh, one of my biggest supporters and pushes me in the gym. We have a gym in our basement, so every day I get to get challenged by my hot wife, who's very jacked and loves working out as well. So it's uh, it's it gets interesting down at the dungeon. So. <laughs> you guys have any kids? Because I imagine they're going to be pretty big if you do. No, unfortunately, uh, at this point in my life, I'm not really looking to have kids. But she has a couple grown kids already, and they are very tall and athletic her daughters played softball volleyball i think her daughter one daughter played on a state championship team if i'm not mistaken so yeah but it'd be kind of cool to go back in time and see what would have happened but at this point in my life i'm a big enough kid she has her hands full of me so. <laughs> but you're saying seriously about the xfl there is a chance if you were given like a tryout or an invitation oh, yeah. for combine you would of course, yeah. Okay. I think I could still play. I mean, I see some of those guys and it's like, whew, I should have maybe tried to come back a third time from football. <laughs> we'll definitely put that out there, <laughs> see if we can gather any steam on that. Uh, so you said you were a wrestling fan growing up. Did you have any favorites? Uh, actually, the story behind how I got involved in watching wrestling, I was kind of just flipping through the channels as a 10 year old, came across a Hulk Hogan uh, promo. Yeah, I was like, man, this guy's pretty intense, it's pretty cool. And, you know, all big and jacked up. And like as a kid, you're like, oh man, this is pretty cool. So that's kind of how I got hooked on wrestling. And then uh, where I grew up in Pennsylvania, it was on all the time. Saturday Superstars and the Ag Hall in Allentown was a big thing and Hamburg Fieldhouse. So I kind of grew up right in a hotbed of wrestling. So it was kind of just a natural progression for me. I was always the type of kid that would do anything on a dare or do anything to try to get a laugh out of somebody or, you know, class clown type of guy. So it kind of fit my, my uh, persona, my uh, attitude, because I never really took anything serious. I was, you know, I was joking around at the movie premiere that I had. I was like, well, I guess all my teachers from back in the day that would yell at me for screwing around and not taking anything seriously. I could have the last laugh now because I've never taken anything too seriously and played in the NFL, wrestled in WWE, and a successful movie producer. So I guess uh, I guess they were all wrong. <laughs> Who did you go to for training when you wanted to get into it? I uh, kind of just meandered through the indies for a little bit on my own and then uh, hooked up with uh, Alpha Anawa'i, better known as the Wild Simones. He had a camp in Allentown, so I uh, was lucky enough to latch on with those guys and had a tryout with his son Samu, and they brought me on a tour of the Middle East and South Pacific, and I did really well, so they invited me to train at their camp, and then uh, started training in Allentown, doing shows for their Federation WXW, and just kind of picked it up really fast. Like I said, I've always, you know, very competitive, love athletics, and, you know, being the class clown kind of guy, fit my, you know, my attitude perfect. So kind of just evolved into the transition into wrestling rather easily. I was fortunate enough to, uh, like I said, pick it up fast. And the training was rather easy, to be honest with you. Like coming from a football background, I was, I was prepared for the physicality of it. And, uh, you know, it was just, uh, Fortunate enough to get in with the right people at the right time and Pops was always, you know, one of my biggest supporters and always pushed me and tried to make me better and, you know, eventually got me a dark match with WWE in Wilkes-Barre in uh, 2003 in, actually I think it was on Halloween 2003 in Wilkes-Barre. Wrestled another fellow WXW alumni, Tommy Swade. Him and I must have had a good enough match because I got signed that next year in January, I think, or February. And then uh, waited. they brought me in in June to OVW to start training. So it's basically how it all happened. Was it John Laurinaitis who you were dealing with when you were signed? Yeah, yeah he called me to tell me that they wanted to bring me in. And, uh, moved out to Louisville 
went through OVW with Danny Davis and, you know, was fortunate enough again to pick it up fast to their system and started, let's see, June, July. The end of June, the start of July, I think it was, so I actually started OVW. And then that September, I was on TV at WWE on Raw already, so I was pretty fortunate to get through it pretty fast. Was Jim Cornette still involved in OVW at that time? Yeah, yep. Do you have any stories about him or any interaction? Uh, nothing that really jumps out at me. I mean, he was just, you know, he's a great mind in the business, so I'd always pick his brain, but I mean, I wasn't really there that long. Right. You know what I mean? I was like three months, four months. So basically my interaction was just, you know, at the arena with him going over to shows because I, I still did the OVW stuff. But yeah, I mean, I always had a great relationship with everybody there. So I didn't really have any issues or stories or, I mean, he's, you know, an eccentric guy. He's, you know, everybody knows about Jim Cornette. He's yeah. Jim Cornette. Yeah. <laughs> free speech kind of guy says what he has on his mind and if you like it great if not that's great too he doesn't really seem to mind <laughs> is there anyone else you were training with at the time there that went on to a significant fame yeah lots of guys uh lashley chris masters uh joey mercury uh johnny morrison i mean the list goes on and on pretty much everybody that went through there at the time got called up to WWE and was successful. Davari, uh, what the heck was the other guy? Mark Capone, he did the, uh, Arab, the Arab, oh, Muhammad, Muhammad yeah. yeah. They were all there with me. So, yeah, Bill DeMott was one of the trainers at the time, and we worked with, he did a lot of work with the bigger guys, and Lance Storm was there, and he did a lot of the stuff with the smaller guys, so I got to work a lot with Bill, and like, you know, hone my craft, because Bill was always, you know, one of the more athletic, bigger guys. So it was cool to work with him and work on some new stuff and learn the psychology through those guys. So, yeah, it uh, it was fun. It was a great group of guys. We were just talking about that. I just ran into Molina at the uh, convention. And we were talking about the, the great crew that we had back then, so. Is it true that your uh, Raw match versus Kane when you debuted was supposed to only be a one-time thing? I found out post match like maybe a week or two later that that was only supposed to be a one-time thing but when when it happened and they started chanting baby killer i kind of thought to myself oh this is good because you know obviously as a heel you want to get a res you know some type of result or reaction or you know heat it's called in the business so once i heard that i was like oh this might have some legs so they were kind of forced to use me. <laughs> How was he to work with uh, behind the scenes? Glenn's awesome, man. He's, uh, I still keep in touch with him. He uh, kind of took me under his wing and kind of molded me and helped me along because I was, you know, very new to the scene. Like I said, I signed in June and was on TV in September. So without him, I mean, without his uh, blessing, I probably wouldn't have stayed around because, you know, he could have easily said, hey, I don't want to work with this guy. And then I wouldn't have been there, so. And Lita was also involved in that angle, obviously. Uh, how was she to work with? No, she was great. Amy's awesome. I had a lot of fun working with her, Edge, all those guys. It was a cool little story and uh, got over really well. And wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for that storyline. So it's funny how every day of my life now for the last 15 years, I get, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. It's all my fault. I'm like, ah. <laughs> so it resonated with everyone, which is cool because as a performer, you know, you want a reaction, you want something to resonate with the crowd. So must have did something right because 14, 15 years later, I still get it every single day of my life. So, And you didn't mind the foot stuff, I guess? No, no I actually have a foot fetish in real life. So I kind of went to Vince and I was like, hey, if there's any way we could integrate it into the character, I think it would add to the craziness of the character because they wanted me to be as big and crazy and psychotic as possible. So I was like, oh, let's try that. And he was like, oh, okay. But it was as simple as that. <laughs> so you and Tony Atlas would get along well, I guess, if you Well, heard. Tony's got a shoe fetish. I like the feet. Tony likes getting kicked in the face with boots and stuff. I'm, I, I, I'm not into that. Uh, you're just more of a foot admirer? I'm more of a foot connoisseur. Yeah, I wouldn't, don't want my wife kicking me in the face anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> And you worked with uh, Heidenreich, who's 
I don't know, I guess a little bit out there as well. Uh, any thoughts on working with him? John was great. I mean, uh, he actually trained at OVW with us as well. And uh, always got along great with John. He was always super easy to work with. Uh, I mean, one of our infamous backstage segments always gets, you know, interesting reactions. And, uh, you know, I mean, overall, everything I did there was fun. I just... Uh, Fortunately, fortunately enough, I had a lot of like memorable things because I've made like the top 50 oh my god moments, the top Royal Rumble eliminations. Like I've had like in the five years I was there, I got a lot of cool things accomplished. So I mean, it's kind of neat that forever in infamy history, the infamous history of pro wrestling, they'll remember me for something. So it's kind of cool. Hyden Wright was also in the CFL as well, but. Uh, his knees took a real beating yeah. and he's not getting around too well these days yeah he played for uh, i think the saints too for a little bit yeah if i'm not mistaken yeah yeah. In yeah. Orleans, yeah yeah and you were on triple h's team at survivor series uh how was he to work with uh he has his moments i mean he he likes having everything his way it's you know it is what it is but like a lot of times if you shot an idea by him he'd shoot it down or you know try to put his spin on it but yeah that's cool you know it was fun the, the match was awesome until maven broke my orbital bone then it was not fun but uh how did he do that oh well, he's supposed to come off the ropes and hit me in the chest with a flying forearm but his flying forearm turned into a flying elbow into the crest of my eye socket and my eyelid like if you go back on youtube or whatever and watch it it's like my eyelids like freaking hanging down over my eye I have a gash like this big and blood everywhere and i was like oh man but the nice thing about it is I got to hit him with a chair afterwards, so I bent the chair. So. <laughs> Why do you think he never really got over? They tried to give him a big push. He was the tough enough winner, but he kind of faded away. The thing about pro wrestling is you just never know, man. Like, the cra like my situation, the craziest stuff, people remember. Yeah. And it sticks with them. I don't know. It's just, I guess, I, I don't know how to explain it. I mean... It's literally taking a piece of spaghetti, throwing it on the wall, and seeing if it sticks. I mean, that's how it was when I was there. Like, they'll, they'll just try something, and if it goes, it goes. If not, then hey, there's always somebody there waiting to take your spot. I mean, that's the, the ironic truth of pro wrestling. You know, if you can't get it done, or it doesn't cut it, or your character's not getting over, always somebody there to come in and try to do it. That's true. And you also worked with uh, Chris Benoit. What, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. What was he like, and did you see any uh, anything knowing him as a person that you would expect what ultimately happened with him? No, Chris was great, man. I had some of my best matches with Chris, to be honest with you. Like, when we were doing that little ECW thing with WWE, him and I had a long stretch where we were wrestling on house shows, wrestling on TV, and like I said, some of my best matches were with him. I'm very proud of my work with Chris, and. We had good, solid, hard-hitting matches. And uh, honestly, to this day, I still think there's more to it than what meets the eye, because I mean, I, I know Chris personal, knew Chris personally, and never in a million years would I have thought that would have happened, but you never know. I mean, obviously something happened, and I'm not an investigator by any means or a criminologist, but it's uh, very out of character, if you ask me someone who knew him personally and saw him every day it's you know nothing i would have ever expected happening and shelton benjamin you also had matches with he's still kicking around in there uh, how is he to work with shelton's great shelton's still one of my best buddies actually i took my wife up to see the guys in wilkesboro pennsylvania when they were up there and he's one of the first guys i saw i was like ah we started laughing telling old stories and introduced him to my wife and just hung out with him for 20 30 minutes and caught up but yeah he's awesome we've always gone along great always uh, always share a good laugh when shelton and i get together and you had a famous lumberjack match with uh, john cena and raw uh, was that one of your big moments of your career <laughs> i guess it depends on who you ask i mean it's cool wrestling john i've wrestled him a bunch of times he actually broke my ribs. He does that side slam thing out of the corner and all 250 pounds of them came down right on my rib. And I still have the little calcification on my ribs and I always joke around with people. I'm like, feel that? Oh my God. I was like, yeah, John Cena did that. Like goofing around there like, really? It's funny. <laughs> so yeah, no, John's a good guy. 
Is he as serious as he comes across as? No, he's actually he's actually uh, pretty uh, pretty silly. I guess would be a good word. Like he likes to goof around, have a good time. Like uh, you know, there's a lot of times where you know, like if we're at an airport or it got stuck somewhere, you know, we sit and polish off a bottle of whiskey or something and just goof around. Like he's a super nice guy. Yeah. How is Tyson Tonko? Tyson was great. We, I think we should have been the tag team champs. Him and I had a nice little run there, and then we'd always end up losing the big show on Kane. But uh, no, we were getting over pretty good. I, uh, I like him. I mean, he's, him and I worked well together, and you know, it's uh, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and you could look back and say this should have happened, or you know, this could have happened, or that could have happened. But I mean. That's one thing I definitely think that WWE dropped the ball on. I think with the way we looked and just, you know, our style of wrestling, it would have been good to have us as the tag team champs. Have you heard from him at all? I haven't heard from him in... I'm friends with him on Facebook and stuff like that. I'll talk to him on there. He's doing uh, gyms, I think, now down in Florida. Okay. He has like a couple of gyms or something like that. Him and his wife. His wife's like a bodybuilder. She's, uh, I think she's just won a couple competitions and stuff too. So, okay. Yeah, he's and he's out of wrestling, I guess. Yeah, yeah, he's not doing anything with wrestling anymore, I don't think, at all. And the big show, you just mentioned him, uh, how was he to be in the ring with? He's fun, yeah. I had pretty good solid matches with him too, so. Uh, I think we did a, I wrestled him in a pay-per-view, I think, so once. We had a little build up to a pay-per-view match. And I remember one time he hit me with a sink. We did a, I think a, a hard, was it hard, something like that. And he actually like pulled the sink from under the ring. Wow. And he hit me with it, it was pretty funny. Cause it's like, oh, he hit him with everything and the kitchen sink. <laughs> People always say he's a funny guy backstage. Did you ever notice that about him? Yeah, yeah, he's a, a jokester. Every, I mean, everybody for the most part likes to have fun and pass the time, you know? Cause you're together all the time. You're on the road. You're traveling. You're flying somewhere. Like for instance, when we did the European tours, we'd be on the, on the road for 17 days, and we'd all be together all the time. So you got to kind of, you know, pass the time, get along, have fun. You know, try to do what you can to create that camaraderie with the with the crew because you're together all the time. Yeah. yeah. That's where some people snap on those long tours. Yeah, I didn't mind it. I mean, you beat you know you beat yourself up pretty good. Like I came home from one one time and I slept for like two days straight. I was beat. You know, you're going to different time zones. You're on a plane. You're in an arena. You're in a hotel. Just kind of turns into the revolving door, you know. But I didn't mind the traveling part of it. And you were gaining some momentum teaming with uh, Goldust, but I guess they released him kind of just as that was building. We were actually supposed to get the straps because uh, Goldust's dad was on the creative team at the time. And he would always buzz me on like what they were going to be doing. So we were supposed to get merch, tag team belts, everything. But he was going through a divorce with his wife. And, you know, I didn't get too involved in the personal side of it. So I just kind of was like, you know, do what you got to do and take care of yourself because it's ultimately the important thing. I mean, wrestling is just wrestling, you know. I don't want to see anybody, like, suffer mental illness or something because of wrestling. So, you know, I was like, hey, man, do what you got to do. It is what it is. But, yeah, it would have been cool. I mean, we, we had great chemistry. We had a lot of fun wrestling together, a lot of fun outside the ring. Probably one of my still favorite guys to work with, so... You know, but hey, like I said earlier, everything happens for a reason, so. Maybe we'll see that in AEW down the road. Never say never in wrestling, man. Never say never. When you went over to ECW, they changed your gimmick, uh, going over the top a bit with your appearance. Uh, was that your idea or the creative idea? No, Vince actually came up to me one time at the ring where we used to all go out to the ring and, and like practice stuff and work on moves and you know, just wrestling around. And he called me over and he's like, hey, I want you to shave off all your hair. I'm like, okay. He's like, and your eyebrows. I'm like, all right. He's like, can go see the makeup lady and see what they can do to make your teeth look bad. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of that, but you know, got another action figure out of it. So, you know, 
kind of, you know, it is what it is. But I, I was always a team player and, you know, did what the boss said. So I went and did it. And I was getting a great push, too. I came out and squashed Lashley, squashed Punk. Uh, Balls Mahoney, I think, I jumped. So I was getting, like, a lot of momentum. And then one day, Steph comes up to me backstage. She's like, oh, my dad just loves what you're doing on ECW. We're going to do the draft and draft you back to Raw. And I was kind of like, hmm. Why? <laughs> so I was always confused about that. I don't know why that happened, but that kind of took away the whole momentum that we built in ECW. And then I don't, didn't really do much after that with the Raw because I don't think they knew what to do with me, to be quite honest with you. And I would shoot ideas to them and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it just ultimately came down to, you know, I, I went and talked to Vince and I was like, look, man. I never sat the bench on any sport I ever played. I didn't want to work my way up to WWE to watch the show. I wanted to be on the show. So, I mean, if there's nothing for me to do, I don't want to be here just collecting a paycheck. And uh, ironically, two days later, I got released, so. <laughs> now, you mentioned your squash CM Punk. Did you uh, have any memories of working with him in uh, ECW? Not really. When I got drafted back to Raw, he broke my nose with his finisher one time. Because he, I was too heavy for him. He'll probably want to admit it, but he couldn't really hold me too well. And freaking cracked me square in the face with that GTS finisher thing. Broke my nose, and I was like, oh, awesome. So I was in the middle of New Orleans with a busted nose, broken and bloody, and couldn't breathe. And yeah, it was fun. I said no one ever. And you worked <laughs> with uh, Val Venus as well, who's yeah. one of the famous characters in wrestling. Any thoughts on him? Val's great. He uh, He's another guy to help me out when I was first starting because I wrestled him a lot on house shows and uh, just, you know, guiding me through the process and, you know, because, uh, you know, backstage in WWE is a whole different world, man. It's like, there's really no way to describe it unless you're there and I've done it. It's just a whole, it's like a small fraternity of people that the outside world never would really understand, basically. And there's a lot of politics involved as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I was never a political kind of guy, so I didn't really, like, try to brown those anybody to get my spot. Because as a kid, my mom and dad would always tell me, cream always rises to the top, so just be the best you could be. And if you're the best, you'll get noticed. And if not, then just try harder. What were your personal interactions with uh, Vince like since you were working with him for a bit there doing the sun angle? Uh, he was great. I never had any issues with Vince. And like I said, I went right to him. And I was like, look, man, I, I don't want to be here collecting a paycheck. Because I didn't. I mean, I'm, I don't want to be there just being a rah-rah guy. I want to be in the mix, you know? It's just how I am. I don't want to watch the show. I want to be on the show. And you eventually popped up in TNA. How did that whole situation come about? Well, Dave Lugano reached out to me. He was one of the writers at WWE when I was there. And he reached out to me. And he's like, oh, we got this idea, blah, blah, blah. And at the time, uh, you know, they had said it was going to lead to something and, you know, that whole deal and it never really materialized because of the money aspect and all that kind of stuff. And I was just kind of like, well, do I really want to do this and not get paid what I think I should get paid or just, you know, nip it in the bud. So kind of just nipped it in the bud and moved on and did my own thing and, you know, like I said, man, I'm not one of those guys that just is along for the ride. I think very highly of myself. I'm, I know I'm a good athlete. I know I have charisma. I know I could, you know, do whatever they ask me to do and do it well. So I wasn't just going to settle, you know. What was working with The Undertaker like? Challenging sometimes because he's like The Undertaker, you know what I mean? So it's like... If you, if you couldn't keep up with them, they kind of shunned you to the side and then brought somebody else in. So, it was, I mean, it was fun. He's a great guy. I, I just, I don't know what the word would be. He's just like, kind of the guy there. Like he could do whatever he wants and Vince, you know, obviously loves him and all that. So, it was kind of challenging breaking in that whole scene, like getting involved in storylines with him and stuff. But, you know, 
I, I never had any issues with him. You know, we got along fine. You know, just a couple things here and there. Maybe like uh, with me and Heidenreich, I don't know. They were sort of kind of hinting that they were going to do me and Heidenreich against him and Kane, and then that never materialized. But I mean, in WWE, they always do that. They start something and then go to something else and something else and something else. You know, they're kind of known for that. So it wasn't surprising, but it would have been cool to be able to do like a little program with them. But you know, it is what it is. Did you ever get to do anything with him outside of the ring when you guys were traveling? No, nah. no, he kind of stayed to himself. Balls Mahoney, uh, you also worked with him. Did you have any thoughts on him? Balls was great, man. He was uh, he was one of those guys. He would do anything to make the match better. Uh, <laughs> crazy. Just, I mean. Look at his track record, man. Like the stuff they used to do back in the original ECW was just off the wall, you know. But great guy. It's a sad, you know, situation that he passed away as young as he did and everything. But no, I had uh, had no issues with him whatsoever. He was fun to work with. Always easy to set the match up with. I actually wrestled with him a bunch of times after WWE on the Indies and always had really good, solid matches with him. And I, you know, I know his wife Gail real well, and you know all that. So you know, he's definitely missed. He was uh, he was definitely one of those characters that was good for wrestling. If you had had full creative control of of your character in WWE, how would you have made your character? <sighs> I probably would have stuck more with the ECW version. I think that was getting over really well. Like it was getting a good response from the crowd. It was creepy, it was scary. The vignettes we were doing like kind of made you like hair stand up on your back kind of thing. So that was fun. I enjoyed doing those. I was kind of bummed out when Steph was like, hey, we're going to draft it back to Raw. Because like, mm. so I was kind of just getting into the flow of the ECW thing, you know? Yeah. And it was fun. But uh, yeah, I probably would have stuck more with that type of character and just kind of rode that out. I think it was definitely headed in the right direction. You know, I was kind of, like I said, upset that it, you know, didn't get a chance to really come to fruition. But like I said, that's what happens there. They they start running with something and then it's like for unknown reasons, they go in another direction. But that's the world of wrestling. What was Batista like backstage? I guess you're probably trained by the same guy. At yeah. Alpha, so you may have had a connection there. Yeah, Dave's great. Uh, Thrilled for all the success he's had with the movies and everything. Uh, I still talk to his mom on Facebook and all that stuff. And Dave's uh, another wild Samoan trainee, and just uh, spent. I actually spent a lot of time with him outside the ring. He's a real good guy. Just you know, obviously because we trained at the same place and came through the same, same, uh, same. Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Anyways, came up through the same ranks and stuff, so it was, you know, it was cool. It's cool to see him, like, in the movies now. It's kind of cool to, you know, watch Guardians of the Galaxy and see him. You know. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of neat. Yeah, he's getting yeah. in bigger and bigger movies all yeah. the time now, it seems. Yeah, the, the James Bond movie he did was good, too. I enjoyed that. No, it's good for him, man. I'm happy for him. I'm glad he's, you know, found his niche and, and getting uh, getting the work that he's getting because it's, it is good. I mean, I honestly, I think he's... I think he started out as a better actor than The Rock. When The Rock first started, he wasn't a very good actor. Now The Rock's awesome, but when, like, comparatively speaking, Dave starting to The Rock starting, I think Dave was a little better. Did you ever train together on the road in the gym? We actually did. We worked out a couple of times together. Yeah. No, like I said, man, he's. I've hung out with him, and we've done stuff outside the ring and partied together and hung out. I mean, super nice guy. Yeah. No, no issues with him whatsoever. What are some of your best lifts in the gym? Uh, my best bench ever was 485. I just squatted 500 not long ago. Deadlifted six. Did uh, 225 for 30. What did I do? 33. Was it 30? 30, right? 225 for 30 reps not long ago. So yeah, still, still hit it pretty hard. Did you have much interaction with Dixie Carter when you were in TNA? Not really. She was kind of like in, a, in her own little room and did a couple of vignettes with her, if I remember correctly, but that was about it. 
never really like hung out with her, talked to her, or nothing like that. It was more of like when we were getting ready to shoot, there she was, and it was due to stuff, and there she went, you know. What was the worst injury you ever suffered in the wrestling business? Probably the broken orbital bone. I mean, that was just a pain in the butt. I was seeing double and triple for like two, three weeks, which is not fun. When you're looking at something and you're like trying to focus and it's everything's all over the place, it was, wasn't fun. And then of course, you know, luckily, thank goodness I didn't like, the doctor was telling me sometimes if you break your orbital bone, your eye could sink into the socket kind of thing. So I was lucky that didn't happen. I didn't have surgery, I didn't need surgery or anything. I just got like, like 17 stitches or something like that. It was a pretty nasty cut, yeah. The fans wanted me to ask you if you had any good rib stories. <laughs> Don't really have any good rib stories. I have a good foot fetish story. The one time we were flying overseas somewhere and Shelton Benjamin, speaking of Shelton, he would always egg me on. So he like, finds this girl and he's like, hey Snitsky, this girl wants her toes sucked. I'm like, and he's like, no, seriously. I'm like, all right, whatever. Cause like I said, I was always a class count kind of guy. I'd do whatever just to get a pop from the boys. So I went out, did my thing. And this other girl's yelling, can I be next? Can I be next? And Shelton's like laughing like a hyena. It is like on a plane in the, like just flying to Europe somewhere. Yeah, it was like, this is funny, yeah. Eric Bischoff was, I think, raw GM when you were uh, working there. Did you have yeah. any interaction with him? Yeah, Eric was great. I was, you know, got along great with Eric. I mean, I, I don't know the backstage scene, like how he was with Vince and all that, but I mean, the segments I did with him came out pretty good, I thought. Like we did a lot of uh, vignettes and stuff like that, and I, I always enjoyed it. Is there any wrestler that's passed away that uh, you were close with? Yeah, uh, Umaga. Eki. He was. Uh, him and I traveled together, and I trained with his family, and know his uh, his nephews really well. And Rikishi was, you know, real tight. Him and I are still tight, and his sons now the Usos. And I remember when Umaga brought the the Usos to a show in Texas to, you know, introduce them to everybody. So it's funny like how everything's come around. Like now they're like this big tag team and several time champions and and all that. So it's kind of cool. And I used to travel with uh, Matt Anawahi as well. He was part of Three Minute Warning and all that with the hurricane. And, you know, obviously, you know, Joe's his brother, Roman Reigns. So. It's kind of cool seeing his success because I remember like when Matt and I would be traveling somewhere, he'd be on the phone talking to him and he was playing football at Georgia Tech at the time. So it's kind of neat how everything's coming full circle, but it sucks that they're both passed on, but you know, probably two of the best athletes you'll ever come across for their size. I mean, those guys could do anything and they were all, you know, well over 300 pounds. But we shared a lot of fun times on the road, a lot of good laughs and a lot of good stories, but it sucks that they're gone, but uh, you know, the memories live on forever. Has anyone ever been dumb enough to pick a bar fight with you? No. <laughs> no, I bounced for a while in the club up in the Poconos, so it was myself, my tag team partner, and another guy that was even bigger than us, so we didn't really have any problems. Yeah. There was a fan that says he saw you against uh, Big Show and Kane in Ireland and wanted to know if you had any memories of being in Ireland. <laughs> Funny story with Ireland, myself and my buddy Mike Kyoto, who's still there as the senior referee, we were at some club party and then ended up going back to a house party and we were leaving to go back to the hotel and it was like 7 or 8 in the morning and I was using the bathroom and Kyoto was outside smoking a cigarette and he had this real nice BMW jacket and I came outside to see a bunch of guys around him trying to steal his jacket. So I came out and he's like, Snitsk, these guys are trying to steal my jacket. I was like, a problem here? And they were like, no, man, we're just trying to check out your buddy's jacket. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. We almost got like a fight at seven o'clock in the morning in Ireland somewhere. So over a BMW jacket. Uh, there's a fan uh, that might be asking you this because of the beard. You might look a bit like Jesus, but do you believe in God or <laughs> higher power? Someone's asking. Well, I don't really want to discuss religion because it's kind of a taboo thing yeah but uh i do appreciate the beard love because i have my microphone strategically hidden in my beard so 
<laughs> Did you ever go out drinking with Steve Austin? I didn't, but I ran into him at the firehouse in Venice Beach one time after working out at Gold's Gym. And he comes up and he goes, it's not my fault. I was like, oh, it's cool. Like Stone Cold, you know, saying your catchphrase to you is kind of cool. Yeah. And I guess you did a tour with CWE in Canada. Do you remember that? They're based in Winnipeg. Who runs it? Danny Warren. I did part of a tour with them. Yeah. Ended up bust. Okay, one of them, I forget, I can't remember. Hell, that was a while ago. You're really going back now. Uh, I think maybe three, two or three shows I think I did. And then I split. Yeah. My lip was like half hanging off. And they didn't have, like, I guess the Canadian medical system, you kind of got to. It's very slow. Yeah. And I was like. I didn't want to sit around and wait for my lip to get fixed. Yeah. So I was like... It's like 12 hours to get stitches, sometimes more. Oh, dude, it was ridiculous. I, I left the show. I went, thought I'd get stitched up and head back. Well, I was waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and then I never got stitched up. I just went back, finished up the show, and I think I ended up at some nurse's house or something, and they tried to, like, use that glue, like that... Yeah, the super medical glue, glue or whatever the heck it is. Yeah. yeah, and then it just it made it worse. So I, I was like, yeah, I had to ditch that one early. It's the only time that ever happened to me. But it was like one of those things where, do I want my lip to fall off halfway through this tour, or do I want to go get it fixed? Because I I busted my lip open really bad once before when I was a kid. I I was jumping. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I was jumping somewhere and my knee whacked me right in the face. And uh, my tooth went through my lip. I still have a scar. And it was like way worse than that. So I never even got stitches. Now that I think about it. I think I just ended up getting it all like they had to scrape it out and let it like scab over or something. It, that was a while ago. That's funny. You're, you're digging deep on that one. Do you have any memories of ECW One Night Stand 2005? That was, uh, yeah, that was the one in Hammerstein Ballroom in New York. I think that was the big the big one where JBL got in a fight with Blue Meanie. Yes. I think that was, like, the big to-do. You were in that battle room, yeah. weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I just remember, like, they were yelling at each other in the back. I, I was like, and I missed it all. I didn't even, like, I didn't even know what happened. But, yeah, it's, uh, that was fun, actually. I liked that. That was a great angle at the time. Like, there was a lot of heat with that. Like, yeah. that was good. Like, I can remember sitting in the, because they had like, a, they had us in the crowd. Yeah. We were like sitting in the crowd. Weren't they letting you guys drink too yeah. or something? Oh, was yeah. that real? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was great. <laughs> yeah. I was like, just sitting there and they kept bringing drinks. I was like, this is awesome. And like, yeah, that was, that crowd was hot, man. Like, it, all I remember about that was like, because at one point we had to walk down to the ring. And like you were like literally fighting through the people to get there. It was nuts. Like that was an awesome crowd. That place is awesome, period, to wrestle, but that night was cool. Yeah. Do you think that uh, because you had so, so many memorable moments that uh, you could potentially be in the Hall of Fame one day? I doubt it. I don't think so. I think like we were talking about earlier, just the politics of wrestling, unless you're like, you know, one of their guys, it's, I don't think so. I don't even expect it. I would never expect it. I'm just glad that people remember me all these years later. It's like I said earlier, as a performer, that's, you know, justification that you did well. Because if somebody remembers your stuff, you strike the nerve with somebody. Like if you're a performer and nobody remembers you, obviously that's not, you know, good. <laughs> Did they ever contact you about coming back because you're still in good shape? They, they kind of kicked it around a couple of times, but it's one of those things where it's like I have so much other stuff going on to just drop my whole life now and go back. It, it would have to be very, very lucrative for me to even consider it, to be honest with you, because I got, you know, the shop going, I got, you know, the stuff with the movie i got you know my wife we're doing stuff we got stuff going on it's like just to up and like drop all that 
after I built it all back up. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't, I don't know. It was, like I said, I take a lot of zeros behind the first number to think about it. What were your thoughts on Little Guido? Nothing in particular. Nice guy. Always a uh, solid worker, real good guy. I think him and I wrestled a couple of times at the ECW version for WWE. Yeah. No, he's, he's great. Yeah. He wrestled RVD too. Yeah. Huge yeah. star. Uh, yeah. How was he in the ring? Uh, tricky. <laughs> Some of those kicks and stuff he throws, you kind of just got to adjust on the fly because you never know where they're coming from or where they're going to land. But as far as like setting up the matches and stuff, he was super easy to work with. Real nice guy. He was doing, uh, I think he did a couple films and stuff too. But uh, I think I just saw him. Where did I just see him kick up at? Isn't he back with TNA now or something? Yeah, he's back doing yeah. part time or something with yeah. Impact. Yeah. Yeah, he's always somewhere. But yeah, he's never really had any issues with anybody, to be honest with you. Like, I got along with all the boys. I just. Uh, I just didn't, like I said, man, I just, I didn't want to be there collecting a paycheck. Like I'm, I consider myself worth a lot more than that. And I'm, you know, I'm watching the show and I'm seeing the guys getting a push and this guy getting a push and that guy getting a push. And I'm like, well, hell, where's my push? Why ain't I getting a push? You know, I could be the good guy. I could be the bad guy. I could be the crazy guy. I could be the goofy guy. You know, obviously I could do it because I've already done it with Kane and got over huge, you know, and they'd always give you the same story. Well, we don't have anything for you. The writers don't have anything for you. I'm like, well, look at me. I'm a walking character. How could you not have something for me? Do you remember which writer came up with the kicking the baby segment? At the time I was doing all my stuff with Glenn, it was Dan Madigan. He was writing all the stuff. And then he eventually went on to uh, write Glenn's movie, See No Evil. I still actually keep in touch with him as well. He's uh. He's awesome. Dan was awesome to work with. A uh, very creative mind. Came up with a lot of cool stuff. And, you know, Glenn's movie was awesome. I uh, enjoyed the first one and the second one. And, like I said, still keep in touch with Dan. And, yeah, I'm 99.9% .9 sure he, he was his, uh, his create, creative mind. <laughs> Is there any agent that you like working with? Uh, I know they sign ag agents to matches there in WWE. Uh, Arn Anderson was probably my favorite. He was awesome. Uh, Arn and I always got along great. Definitely uh, hit it off when I was working there. He helped me out with my style and my matches and all that kind of stuff. And you know, always you know, extra go to extra mile kind of guy to help me and. Just loved working with Arn. I see he's with AEW now, so that's cool. Cause they kind of gave him the shaft at WWE from what I heard. So I'm glad he's, you know, still in the business and doing well. Cause he's got a lot to offer, man. He's a, uh, I don't like throwing the word genius around much, but he's definitely got a, a mind for wrestling, no doubt. Is there any wrestler that was particularly hard to work with in the ring? Not really. Uh, the hardest part of WWE was just setting up the matches because you have all the personalities, you got all the, you know, the personas, the, you know, uh, what's the word I want to use? A lot of guys had to have, it, you know, everything laid out from A to Z, which I didn't always like doing. Like, I like a little creative liberty, but like when I was there, they were like writing everything out from start to finish. And it was like, well, what if something happens? And you, you know, you gotta be able to ad lib and do stuff on the fly. That's the only thing I didn't like, like having to do everything, like start to finish. Well, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, and then I'm gonna do this. Like, but uh, yeah, I mean, that was the hardest part of WWE, was just sitting up the matches. I'm, I mean, I just enjoyed performing, I still do. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any problems with anybody that I, you know, that jump out at me. Like I said, it was just tough to set up some matches once in a while, but ultimately they came out good and that's all that matters, you know, send the people home happy and entertained. And for the money you get, your most money's worth out of pro wrestling. You go to an NFL football game, you're dropping a whole week's pay and your team loses, you're miserable all week. 
you go to a uh, WWE show, you're getting the drama, the stunts, the highs, the lows, you're happy, you're sad, you're getting the full gamut of emotions and probably a fifth of the cost, you know? So I think, you know, we more the most bang for your buck definitely is pro wrestling. Do you remember your elimination of Paul London at the yeah. Rumble? Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, I think it, I think it was the number two ever elimination in the history of WWE, so that's kind of cool. Did you ever wrestle Rey Mysterio? Yeah, a bunch of times. Yep. How is he in the ring? Easy. I mean, he's 150 pounds. Yeah. It's like super easy to do stuff with him because he's so light. You just toss him around and then, you know, miss something and he fires up his comeback and it's 619. It's not, you know, rocket science. <laughs> Is there anyone backstage in WWE that surprised you when you got back there after watching it on TV? As far as being a nice, maybe he comes off as a heel on TV or, or the opposite, somebody that's nice on TV and is a dick. I think Orton. Orton has times where he could be a dick to fans and people and stuff. But he was, like him and I always got along good. He was always super cool with me. But a lot of people like see his character and they're like, yeah, what a dick. And then sometimes he is a dick, I, you know, everybody is. But yeah, I think Randy, for the most part, probably is the most opposite of his character. What are your top three favorite wrestlers of all time as mm -hmm. a fan? As a fan. Well, got to put Hulk Hogan up there because he's the reason I actually stopped flipping through the channels to watch wrestling in the first place. Uh, this was a tough one. There were so many good characters back in the 80s. It's tough to put three into a box. Uh, that's a tough one. Oh, jeez. I hate to be cliche, but probably Undertaker and Kane. And then like, Andre the Giant, you got uh, the Samoans. I mean, there's so many good guys back then. It's tough to pick just three. Yeah. <laughs> Any favorite match of yours personally from your career? Uh, I mean, to say, the Kane match at Taboo Tuesday would be kind of the expected answer, but I, I mean, that was awesome. And it was on my mom's birthday. It was my first pay-per-view and I beat Kane. So like, that's kind of right up there. But the coolest thing to me was like walking out at WrestleMania and there's 90,000, 80,000 people. And you're like, I'm at WrestleMania. You know what I mean? Like as a wrestler, that's like the Super Bowl of wrestling. Yeah. So for a guy from Nesquahoning, Pennsylvania, a town of 3,000 people, to walk out at WrestleMania and perform is kind of like, yeah, this is pretty sweet. <laughs> Did you have any say in your theme music? No. No, they kind of, Jim Johnson at the time kind of geared everything towards your character, so he knew the character and designed it from there. But I love my theme music. Yeah. Do you think you were treated fairly overall in WWE? Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they threw me into a situation. Nobody knew who I was. I basically came out of nowhere, did what I had to do, resonated with the fans. They were forced to bring me back. I ran with it, did what I did. And, you know, like I said earlier, 15 years later, we're still sitting here talking about it. So I must have did something good. And you had a short run against Ezekiel Jackson. How was that? Uh, I never really wrestled him. I, w I didn't have any, I never wrestled him. Okay. Yeah, he was, uh, I think he was officially the last ECW champion, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah, yeah. But he's a good guy. Him and I tagged up on uh, TNA. So, yeah. Were I don't you? even know if he's still even in the business. I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. Obviously, he has a fan because there was a fan question about that. Oh, really? <laughs> but, uh, no, he was, I mean, I, he was a big dude. Like, yeah. he was big. But yeah, I don't know what he's doing now. It's kind of weird.
Like it's like these names you're throwing out at me. It's like, yeah, I wonder what ever happened to those guys because they're not like really staying in the scene, you know? Yeah, there was a lot from your era yeah. that kind of just dropped yeah. in wrestling. It's weird. Like now that you think of, no, now that you mentioned it, I'm thinking of guys. I'm like, yeah, I don't know what ever happened. <laughs> Mike Knox too, he looks yeah. kind of like you, he seems to have disappeared. I actually pitched an idea at WWE about him and I tag team and they never did anything with it. Hmm. They thought that would have been a cool tag team. Yeah, especially with yeah. the beards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they just, I, I, I don't know if they didn't see it or they just had other things on their plate, but they never really went with it. But I did pitch that idea too. What was your favorite arena to perform in? Ooh, that's a tough one. Well, as a kid, I'd always go to the Spectrum to watch wrestling. So I always wanted to wrestle in Philly. I grew up outside of Allentown and used to go to shows at Stable Arena. So that was one I always wanted to wrestle at. And then obviously, growing up in the Northeast, uh, Madison Square Garden. And I was fortunate enough to wrestle in all three of those places the first year I was with WWE. So I knocked them right off the bucket list to start. So, yeah. yeah, it's pretty cool. And this is a fan question. You don't have to go into detail on this, but what did you think of the whole Montreal screw job thing? That was before your time in WWE, but. Well, from what I've seen or heard about it, it was pretty effed up. I mean, to switch the finish like that, not, no. I mean, I could see why Brett was pretty pissed. You know, I think it was uh, a screw job. <laughs> Yeah, it sucks. It, it definitely put a black eye on the business because everybody, I mean, at the time, everybody heard about it. And I mean, the rumor is Brett went in and punched Vince in the face and locked him on his ass. So, I mean, if he was that pissed off about it, obviously it was effed up. Yeah. Because Brett's, you know, Brett's been in the business his whole life. And for him to have that reaction, you know, obviously it tells you something. It was a little fishy. Were you in the company when the plane ride from hell happened, or was that no. a before your time? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that would have been fun, though. No. Yeah. Uh, and last question from the fan I'll ask is, uh, what are your thoughts on wrestlers using steroids? Well, I'm one of those kind of guys that, like marijuana is the big thing now, like legalizing marijuana. I always say, it's your body, you choose to put into it what you want. So, I don't really have a view on it. I've never touched them, never done anything like that. Uh, I was always just a naturally bigger guy. I always got by just on my talent. I never really had to do anything like that. But, uh, you know, to let you drink a case of beer till your liver dies, to let you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day till you get lung cancer. They let you tan yeah. until you get skin cancer. Yeah, so I mean, what, you know, what's the, where do you draw the line? If a guy wants to take something to make him feel better, look better, perform better, you know, why not? You know, look at Viagra. Yeah, that's the same thing. It's a performing performance enhancer. So, I mean, the coffee is. Yeah. You know, like where do you draw the line? Now marijuana is big in the States, like legalizing it. Colorado's making a killing on it. So now everyone's like, oh, we should legalize marijuana. You know what I mean? Is it legal in Pennsylvania? Yeah. Oh, it is legal. Yeah. Medical marijuana is legal in PA. And for what I've been hearing, they're trying to push it through legalizing it straight across the board. So it is in Canada now, but it's yeah. you can't like just go into a shop and buy it and yeah. order it. Yeah, I mean, to me it's your body. You know, who am I to tell you what you can or can't do? I mean I had a friend growing up whose dad would always say, it's funny that you asked that question because my, my one friend's dad would always say, now remember guys, anything in moderation is not going to kill you. So just don't go overboard with it and you'll be fine. Like I always remember him saying that because we always used to go out drinking. Like all the parents knew you were drinking back then. And they were like, just moderation, moderation. And we'd always joke around about it. So, I mean, looking, you know, to that question, it's like, how do you determine how much beer is okay to drink? How much do you determine how many smokes are okay to smoke? Like, how do you determine how many Viagras are okay to take to your, you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, it's weird. Like, I don't know, there's such a stigma with it that it's like, 
and let's be honest, there's no professional athlete that's 100% natural. They're always taking some type of supplement or some type of stimulant or some type of something. Yeah. I mean, it's just the way it is. Everybody's looking for the edge to get better. So if you want to do it, hey, have at it. It's your body. I don't like, I don't condone it. I don't, uh, you know, say, yeah, you know, but ultimately you're going to do what you got to do. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. And if you're not born with size or strength or any of that kind of stuff, you know, most guys will experiment with it. But, I mean, like I said, I've always been, like, bigger guy, naturally stronger guy. Like, when I was a kid, I'd, have, I'd come home from school, there'd be a ton of coal in the front yard. I had to shovel the ton of coal in the coal buckets, carry it around the back of the house and put it in the coal bin. So doing that kind of stuff, you're just going to get stronger. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just the way it is. But, yeah, I don't know, I guess to each their own, and if, you know, if that's the route you choose to take, you know, try to be safe with it or careful or however you can do it, I mean, I don't know, never really got into that side of anything. Took pain pills once in a while here and there just because of the nature of the beast, you know, you're bouncing around, you're sore all the time, you're in a rental car, you're in a different bed, da 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 da, -da. like that's the only stuff I really ever took. And that was just for more of a comfort thing, because you're always sore, you're always stiff, you're always uncomfortable. So that's about all I've ever really experimented with. All, you know, prescription, obviously. I'm not gonna take something that I have no idea what the hell it is. <laughs> so safety first. Now, you, brought up, uh, you brought up Viagra, your wife's in the room, so maybe this isn't a question necessarily for you, but <laughs> is there one town that you noticed had the best uh, arena rats for wrestlers? <laughs> I never got into the whole rats thing, man. Like, I'm, I like, I mean, as you can see, I'm almost 50 years old and I take pretty good care of myself. I don't want to stick my you-know-what into something that's going to make it fall off. <laughs> so, I was never into that whole scene. We'd hit Hooters in a strip club or, you know, whatever, but I never, wasn't my cup of tea, man. If I, like, I don't know, just always with the AIDS stuff going around and all that kind of shit, is it really worth it? I don't think so, you know. You you're always have your hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> was it there for you as a wrestler, though? Did you have, like... Well, there's always, like, girls hanging out at the hotels and at the shows. And, I mean, every time we did tours, everybody knew what hotel we're staying at. So yeah. there'd always be girls hanging around and just, you know, whatever. But I was never one to risk my health over some sort of instant gratification. Because I always knew someday I was going to do other things besides wrestle. I didn't get into wrestling to wrestle till I'm 60 years old. I mean, like I said, I've always been an athlete. I played pro sports. Wanted to wrestle, did it. Now I'm doing the movie thing. I like setting goals for myself and just constantly moving forward. Like, uh, I just got inducted into the Pennsylvania Sports Hall of Fame last year. So that's like one of my biggest accolades that I'm most proud of. Because it's not just because of wrestling. It's because of my whole body of work as an athlete. So that's cool. That's like my most precious achievement, so to speak. Would you ever get into politics like Kane now is the mayor of Knoxville? No, nah, not my cup of tea. I'd be too offended. I, I'd offend too many people. Did you ever wrestle Bob Holly? Yeah, Bob's great. Yeah, always had good solid matches with Bob. Yeah, real good guy. I think he still wrestles. Yeah. He's still doing some still stuff. Good yeah, show. yeah, Bob's a good guy. Yeah. No, always had uh, always had fun working with Bob. Bob, a funny story about Bob, real quick. We were wrestling in New York, and we had a spot set up in a match where he hit me in the head with a chair, and I forget exactly how the finish was supposed to go, but he hit me with the chair, and my head split open. I got, I ended up getting like seven or eight stitches or staples or something, and he hit me, and the blood just spewed out of my head, and I, I was like selling, and I saw the blood, and I was like, get the chair, hit me again, and he's like, what? I'm like, hit me again. So he hit me again, and I was like, blood everywhere. I was like, oh, this is so cool. We got back, and the doctor on hand's like, oh, you're gonna need stitches. I'm like, all right. 
He's like, I don't have any uh, anesthesia or whatever the hell they call it that they shoot in there. I was like, yeah, I just stitch it up. So I'm sitting there getting stitches, and Bob comes back. He's like, yeah, all right. I'm like, hell yeah. And he's like, just shaking his head. He's like, you're effed up, man. I was like, ah, it was a good spot in the match. <laughs> it's a funny little story. Well, speaking of that, I mean, with your size, you probably would have done well in MMA. Uh, if it had been more popular after football, do you think you would have considered that? Uh it's hard to say because I'm like a spur of the moment kind of guy like I always wanted to do wrestling and then when football finished I was like I'm doing wrestling so it was like I didn't put a lot of thought into it I just knew I was going to do it so like if MMA was like it is now back when I was 10 years old I might have been flipping through the channels and saw that and decided to do that instead of wrestling you know what I mean yeah like it, it was more of like it caught my attention as a child and I wanted to do it you know what I mean so like, maybe, I, I can't really say for sure because I, I wasn't put in that situation. But it's definitely, like I've trained with, one of my buddies had a dojo and Nesco owning a uh, buddy of mine, Kevin, and uh, he had the Dylan, Kevin Dylan, he was a, like a competitor and did all the, the Tong Sudo I think we were doing. And I've worked out with him a bunch of times and stuff, and still have my gi and all that. So, yeah, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. What do you think of today's wrestling products? I know you don't follow it that closely, but uh, there's a lot of companies out there. I, I don't want to be like totally demeaning to anybody, but today's wrestling isn't the type of wrestling that probably would have caught my attention as a kid for the through the channels. Like, my wife and I DVR it and we'll watch it and there's like a lot of it I fast forward through, to be quite honest with you. Like, it doesn't interest me. Uh, Bray Wyatt, probably my favorite guy. Braun Strowman, I enjoy watching. They're probably the only two guys that like I really get excited about seeing. Uh, the other stuff, so much cookie cutter stuff now, it's like, I can't get into it. Like, in all the guys, it's like, there's no larger than life characters. There's no guys that make you go, wow, that guy's gonna kick somebody's ass. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I liked about it when I was a kid. And I'm not saying it because I'm a bigger guy. Obviously, when I was 10 years old, I wasn't this big. Yeah. So, like, that's just what caught my eye. And I could always remember, like, seeing the guys and being like, wow, those guys are so, like, impressive and, larger than life and like now you watch wrestling and it's like my wife's bigger than 90 percent of the guys you and know that I mean? is true but your wife is also larger than a normal guy but yeah yeah it is true it's crazy yeah yeah my wife's like a former volleyball player she's six one jacked i mean anybody who follows me on social media sees all our workout stuff i mean like she's like man i'm bigger than most of these guys i'm like yeah you could probably kick most of their asses too it's like like there's there's no more aura of ass kicking guys. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Like back in the day, if you saw a pro wrestler out in a bar, you were like, "Wow, I ain't messing with that guy." Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like now you see them and it's like, "Hell, I could kick his ass." They wouldn't even stand out. Most yeah. Of them now. Yeah. It's like it's crazy to me. Like to me, like I want to see somebody where I'm like wow look at that guy like somebody you don't see every day you know that's like the whole the whole encapsulation of your emotions like wow that guy's gonna tear somebody's head off or man like when the ultimate warrior would come out you'd be like look at this guy he's like ah, doing all the stuff and he's jacked and he's like slamming people and it's like you saw him out on the street you'd be like damn look at that guy yeah you know now it's like like you said you see somebody you're like I'm a professional wrestler, you kind of laugh. You're like, really? <laughs> like it's, it's, I don't, I don't even know the word I want to use. It's just not exciting to me. Like if I see a, a 180 pound guy wrestling a 180 pound guy, like it does nothing for me. That's a high school fight. Yeah. <laughs> it's like some of the guys look like they're 12 years old. It's yeah. like, you know, hit the gym, take care of yourself, do something. I mean, 
I, I don't know. I, it, maybe because I'm an athlete and I've been an athlete all my life and I've played pro sports and I know what it takes to get to that level. Like now you could just throw on a pair of sneakers and a pair of shorts and be like, oh, I'm a professional wrestler. Like, I don't know, it just doesn't work for me, you know? And how did you transition into movies? Well, another thing I've always wanted to do on the bucket list and same thing as wrestling, man. I was a kid flipping through the channels and you saw Friday the 13th or Halloween and you were like, oh my God, this is awesome. Like just the music and the can it's just, I mean, it was awesome. When you grew up in those times, that was just the thing. It was like, oh, Friday the 13th. So for me, like I said, it was just a natural progression because that's just who I am. And you know, I, I just, I like to set goals and do different things, and that was just something I always wanted to do. And I was fortunate enough to meet the right people, and I had an idea for a film, and I threw it out there, and we wrote it up, and shot it, and it came out really good, and, you know, very proud of it. We won the best horror feature film at the Philadelphia Film Festival. A lot of other awards as well, but we're on Prime, Amazon, iTunes, Redbox, all that. So any of you people up there in Canada, 100 Acres of Hell, check it out. I don't know, what's your cable company up there? Rogers is one of the main yeah. ones. But you have like and Amazon Netflix Prime and everything, and right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's on Amazon Prime, all that. 100 Acres of Hell, 100 Acres of Hell. I co-wrote it, co-produced it, starred in it. Fight coordinator, stunt coordinator. So, wore a lot of hats. Very proud of it. Came out awesome. If you guys are into like the 80s slasher flicks, check it out. Because I was, I wanted to do a hom homage to that. And I think, you know, I think we hit a home run with it. Did you fund it yourself too? Some of it, and then uh, called in a lot of favors. I know a lot of business people, and one of my friends actually owns the airport in Reading, Pennsylvania. So, uh, got a helicopter for free, an airport for free. Wow. Which is, uh, if you're paying for it, talking a lot of money. <laughs> so. What matches of yours would you recommend to a fan if they're just watching my channel for the first time and they haven't seen your career? What would you suggest them to go watch? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. Well, obviously go see the Taboo Tuesday match with, with Kane. I'm not sure when the episode aired where I hit him with the chair and he fell on Lita, but you definitely would check that one out. Check out the Royal Rumble match that we talked about earlier where I got whacked square in the eye because you'll see it and you can see how pissed I am and Maven was like, oh. <laughs> and then it was fun because I got to bend the chair over his head, like I said, so he got his payback. But yeah, those three are probably... And then, uh, hmm. Oh, the uh, Royal Rumble elimination with Paul London. That was pretty cool. Our Survivor Series was the one with Maven. The Royal Rumble is the one with uh, Paul. So check those out. That was that clothesline's always like every time I watch it still to this day I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Did you ever have any issues with uh, Bradshaw? You don't seem like a guy that no. you would have picked on, but he was <laughs> No, he didn't pick on me. Did no, you? we actually got along really well because he's a former football player too, so we'd always talk football and sports and stuff and man, I never had any problems with him. Did you notice any of some of the other stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, they, you know, he tortured Miz like you would never believe. Threw him out of the locker room, made him dress in the hallway, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was, he had his moments. <laughs> so if people want to book you now, uh, do they do it through ESS promotions if they want to bring you? You could do it that way, or if you want to just contact me directly, you could do book snitsky at AOL.com. I uh, handle all my own bookings through there. Uh, do a lot of convention stuff now. I started getting into the comic cons because of the movie and all that kind of stuff. So doing a lot more of the conventions and the, the you know icons of wrestling we just did today. Uh, yeah, just reach out. If we can make it work, we'll make it work. Uh, like I said, I have the business now, Priority One Surplus in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. So pretty busy with that, and that's you know doing well. Knock on wood. So. Uh, I got a great life, man. I'm uh, beyond happy. I got a great wife, nice house, nice gym. Uh, couldn't really ask for anything more. I'm doing all right. 
And for social media, where can we follow you? Twitter, I'm um, at Big Gene Snitsky. I'm verified, so look for the blue check mark. Instagram, The Real Snitsky. And I don't really do much Facebook stuff with wrestling, so hit me up on Instagram or Twitter for that. But if you want to check out the film, there's uh, 100 Acres of Hell on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Give it a watch. Hit me up. Let me know how you liked it. I'm always there for the fans, man. I always take time to answer and, and shoot the shit with everybody. So without the fans, there'd be no Snitsky. So I'm not one of those kind of guys that ever turns down autographs or pictures or any that kind of stuff. I like my fans. They're obviously pretty good. Are you going to be doing other films? Uh... Yeah, we have a synopsis for part two of the film already. And, you know, obviously it depends on how well the first one does. But got contacted to do a few other things. But I'm kind of putting it off till I see how to film those. All right, well, thanks a lot for talking to us. Can we get your wife in to say hi? No, she's not as <laughs> good, good luck with that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I don't want to piss her off anyway. Yeah. She's, uh, yeah, she's awesome. My wife, Carolyn, everybody, uh, that, like I said, that follows me on any social media platform, see her and I, because we're always posting goofy videos down at the dungeon, so check those out. Uh, all my Canadian fans, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Like I said, there'd be no Snitsky if it wasn't for all you fans. Keep watching, uh, keep watching for me because you never know where I'll show up. And check out the film, 100 Acres of Hell. Hit me up, let me know how you like it. And check out the, uh, the store, PriorityOneSurplus.com. All the good stuff, uh, all the surplus stuff, military, camping, all kind of stuff. So check that out and thanks for having me, appreciate it. Could we get it? It's not my fault. If all the people in Canada don't watch the Hannibal TV, it's not my fault.